a, uh, for those watching online, we had the uh, camera die, so we had to reboot it. But we're, we're again still at the end of verse 16. Um, you think about the trembling of the earth, you know, that, that's accompanied with this. Um, I, I've seen, I'm sure you've seen movies where maybe you see like a herd of elephants running and, it, and, and if you had a camera there, it would be like the camera shakes because of just how, you know, obviously how heavy the, pe how heavy the elephants are. But you, if you have a lot of elephants in an area, um, and, and again, they're running, you could probably feel the earth shake, right? And think about this from the Philistines. Um, obviously, they don't see who's, aff who's aff afflicting them probably because of them attacking themselves. But, you know, if you feel a great trembling of the earth, you might think that a mighty, a very powerful army is sort of right on the doorstep and that's what's causing that trembling so there's great reason for them to be afraid and the idea again is that either they're physically killing themselves or if the if it's the idea that they're dispersing here and there you almost picture the idea that they're trampling over one another trying to figure out what's going on and you know this doesn't happen quite as much anymore but you think about you know black friday shopping right sometimes You've seen videos of people trampling over other people. Um, I know, uh, uh, you know, I'll just give you this example. Many of you may remember back in 2015, they had, a, uh, uh, they, they had an active shooter alert on Mississippi State's campus, uh, and I was at school that day. And, you know, it didn't turn out to be anything serious, but I remember when they gave the all clear, we went out of one building and we weren't out of that building about five minutes when I think a golf cart backfired. Um, and you know, that, that sort of almost gives off a sound like a gun. And all of us that were in that building ran back into that building, right? And it, it was sort of like a, a stampede in a way. Obviously, we're not running over each other and killing one another, but that's sort of the idea that I think about here. Um, people that are sort of running over each other, trying to figure out what's going on and trying to escape. So verse 17, Saul said unto the people that were with him, Number now and see who is gone from us. And when they had numbered, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. So Saul figures out, or he wants to figure out who's missing here. And so Saul would have heard the report from his scouts that, that maybe have relayed this message to him about what's going on. You know, Saul might have naturally thought that this is the work of some of his own soldiers, Right? Uh, which, in, which, which it would be the case that that assumption would be true. So what he does is he just simply calls the officers and he just wants a head count of who all is here, number the people. And it turns out that in the process of doing that, that they come to the realization that, that uh, Jonathan and the armor bearer are not there. And I believe if you keep in mind, at this point, Saul only had 600 soldiers with him in Geba. So they could do this pretty relatively quickly. And, and by verse 17, there's the recognition that Jonathan and the armor bearer are not there. Um, and you would think that Saul, being the father of Jonathan, that he would be uh, naturally worried about the fate of his son, uh, which could be the case. Uh, certainly you would think that would be the case, but we won't talk about this uh, this week. But next week we'll talk about how uh, Saul will almost put his son to death later on in the chapter. So verse 18, after numbering the people, they've heard the great tumult. And so verses 18, Saul wants to uh, call, uh, consult with God. Verse 18, Saul said unto Ahijah, bring the hither the ark of God, for the ark of God was at that time with the children of Israel. And it came to pass while Saul talked unto the priests that the noise that was in the host of the Philistines went on and increased. And Saul said unto the priest, withdraw thine hand. So again, he first asked Ahijah, right? And we talked about this last week, but who is Ahijah? Priest. Yeah, Ahijah is the priest. He's the grandson of Elijah, or not Elijah, Eli. And we know that because Ahijah is a priest, he also has the ephod with him. And again, the ephod was, uh, you know, it had the two stones that were thought of to, to be able to communicate with God. And so when Saul tor turns toward Ahi towards Ahijah, you sort of get the idea that, that Saul is consulting God. That's what he's trying to do by talk to Ahi talking to Ahijah. 
Now, there are some translations that state that instead of the ark of God, um, they're calling for, uh, that, that Saul's actually calling for the ephod. Um, and one thing that you keep in mind that at this point, the ark of the covenant is still in kerjath Jerem, which is still a considerable distance from Geba. Uh, Geba. And so when you're thinking about putting yourself in that situation, there's some that say that this is actually the ephod is what, what he's really talking about. That's how it should be translated because it doesn't make sense for um, at least, you know, kerjath Jerem was so far away from Geba, and it would take a lot of time to get there. And so because you're, you're trying to respond to this, uh, to the Philistines quickly, it, it doesn't seem to make sense that this is referring to the Ark of God. That's how some see this verse. But we also keep in mind that, that it could have been the case that Saul brought the Ark with the army to Geba, and that's what, um, and that's what Saul wants to consult. But the important thing is that, that Saul, by trying to go to a high jut, he's wanting to consult God in this matter. But the problem is, verse 19, that Saul gets impatient. Again, verse 19, it came to pass while Saul talked unto the priest that the noise that was in the host of the Philistines went on and increased. So you might get in mind the picture that, you know, they're going through the process of either putting the ephod on or getting the ark set up to where they can talk, uh, and, and however that may have occurred. And while that whole process is going on, the noise that they're hearing in the distance gets louder. And the indication is, is that the cries of the Philistines are getting worse, which is a good sign to the Israelites who obviously want them defeated in battle. And so what Saul says essentially is withdraw your hand. Saul did not want to wait around. And so when Saul says to Ahijah, withdraw thine hand, whether that's from the ephod or whether it's from the ark of God, it's the fact that at this point, Saul didn't feel the need to consult with God anymore. Whether by the ephod or whether by, you know, setting up the ark, Saul says at this point, it's no longer necessary to consult God. And so Ahijah, withdraw your hand. And again, this is, this is an instance where really Saul is being very impatient. Uh, according to some Jewish writings later on, uh, some of the, the Jewish scholars um, for several, several centuries in the past have often looked down on this event by Saul. But you think about that when we, we think about the application for us. You know, sometimes we can do the same thing that Saul tells Ahijah to do, withdraw thine hand. Uh, you know, you think about that in, in the sense of maybe we pray a lot about a decision or we pray a lot about some something that's afflicting us and we're, we're praying about it as, as long as the unknown is there about what's going to happen to us and then all of a sudden maybe we get a good report maybe we get a decision that we like and then as a result we withdraw our hand from praying to God about the matter anymore right and so we sort of get the answer that we want we we hear the noise that we want around us and then for that very reason we stop praying because we we think that everything's fine we don't need god's help anymore um you know that 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 applies to you know dealing with uh, disease and de disease and, and sickness in life uh that that applies to dealing with difficult decisions in life um and, and in light of what's going on over the next couple of weeks with the, the presidential election, whoever um, gets in office, whether it's the, the person that you want or not, there are going to be some people that look at it and say, you know, we've got our guy in office, and so now we don't have to pray as much about it anymore. Um, some, may, some people may take that perspective about it, but, but the point being is that when it comes to, to situations in life, we can never withdraw our hand from consulting God in the matter. Unfortunately, Saul does that here, and more than likely, that this is the time frame where Saul's going to make a, a very bad oath uh, that we'll talk about in a few minutes. But just when you think about this passage, again, we should never withdraw our hand when it comes from consulting God about, about very, very tough decisions in life. That's why we pray so we can consult with God about, about anything. All right, so verse 20. 
Saul and his men arrived. Saul and all the people that were with him assembled themselves, and they came to the battle, and behold, every man's sword was against his fellow. And there was a great discomfiture. Uh, I believe that's how you pronounce that. Discomfiture. Moreover, the Hebrews that were with the Philistines before that time, which went up with them into the camp from the country round about, even they also turned to be with the Israelites that were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, all the men of Israel which had hid themselves in Mount Ephraim, when they had heard that the Philistines fled, even they also followed hard after them in the battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle passed over unto Beth Avon. Right, so Saul and his men arrived by verse 20. And again, you, you keep in mind all of this that really has been set up by what Jonathan said about God in 1 Samuel 14, verse 6, when he told his armor bearer, that come and let us go over to the, to the garrison of these uncircumcised, that, uh, that it may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. That was Jonathan's conviction, and basically by verse 20 that had come to pass. Jonathan and his armor bearer sort of started it, but God sort of finished the matter in terms of getting the, the Philistines to retreat. And it really shows that by verse 20, Israel's most powerful weapon was God. They might have worried about the weapons that they had in the chapter before. They didn't have the, the best weaponry, but again, God was their best weapon. And it resulted in them being victorious. So verses 21, through, verses 21 and 22, sort of the idea that you've got reinforcements that come with Saul and his army. Now we keep in mind verse 21... We mentioned before that it was possibly the case that the Philistines had taken some of the uh, Israelites. Um, and again, the, the word Hebrew means to cross over. So again, this would refer to the, to the Israelites that maybe crossed over with the Philistines, either by will or either by their own choice or by their, because um, they were taken in bondage. Whatever the case may be, they return and they come with Saul and his army to attack the Philistines. Likewise, verse 22, the men that had hid themselves in Ephraim come, to, come, with, uh, come and meet Saul, and they attack the Philistines as well. And if you keep in mind 1 Samuel 13, verse 6, this is where that verse sort of ties back in. Because in that verse, we read about some Israelites that ran and hid themselves in caves and thickets and rocks and high places and pits. And so those men that are being talked about in 1 Samuel 13, verse 6, are really the same men in verse 20 and 14, 22 that have come to the aid of Saul and his army. And so now the Israelites, by verse 23, um, at least when they're pursuing after them, they're simply doing the mop-up work. They've already been defeated in terms of their morale. They're, they're running away. The Israelites are chasing them down. And we're told that Beth Avon was really about a few miles northwest of Michmash. And so you think that everything is fine by verse 23, because the Philistines are defeated. Well, if you keep reading, you realize that everything's actually not fine. Verse 24, and again, verses 24 through 27, we might call this Saul's oath, which is the main focus of our, our study tonight, Saul's oath. Verse 24, Saul makes a very hasty decision. The men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening, that I may be avenged on mine enemies, so none of the people tasted any food. Again, this oath was probably given back before verse 20. Uh, verse 24, this oath that's being talked about, uh, it's not something that happens after, but it's sort of elaborating on something that, that, that occurs within the, uh, within the last section. Right, so the oath that Saul has given here, um, more than likely this occurs back in verse, before verse 20, before they leave. And so when he makes this oath, he's sort of judging two different things. From, a, from, a, from looking at this from a military strategy or, or as a general of his army, he's looking at this in two different ways. He's thinking about, he's got to think about the morale and the stamina, stamina of the army. He's also thinking about the level of, of defeat for the Philistines. And so what Saul decides to do is essentially say that the best way that the morale and the stamina of my soldiers will remain true 
as if we continue to fight against the Philistines and completely destroy them. So we put, we put all of our eggs in that basket to keep pursuing, pursuing after them no matter what difficulties may lie in the way of that. The problem is, is that the people were distressed because they needed nourishment, um, because they ran out of food. And so Saul's bet's sort of going to turn around on himself. A lot of times in, in, in wars before, a lot of times battles end not necessarily because of the high casualty rates, but because of running out of food. Um, and, and certainly armies need, need, need food to survive. And so verse 24, the, we've got the important phrase there at the end, so none of the people tasted any food. Because the oath that Saul made was that if any man eats food until the evening, um, the, the curse, generally the, the punishment for breaking that curse was often death. Um, and so people did not want to break the oath that Saul had made. So nobody tasted any food. But verses 25 through 27, we read about a man that tastes food, and it turns out that it was Saul's son, Jonathan. Verse 25, and all they of the land came to a wood, and there was honey upon the ground. And when the people were come into the wood, behold, the honey dropped, but no man put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. Jonathan heard not when his father charged the people with the oath, Wherefore he put forth the end of the rod that was in the hand, and in his hand, and dipped it in a honeycomb, and put his hand to his mouth, and his eyes were enlightened. So Jonathan tastes of honey, verse 25. The Israelite army in their pursuit of the Philistines, they come to really what is a forest. Um, that's one way in which the word wood is translated, a forest. Right, so the people, everybody notices that there's honey on the ground, but as verse 25 indicates, nobody's going to put their hand there to pick up the honey and eat it because Saul again had made an oath that they could not eat of anything until that evening after they had been completely defeated, the, the Philistines. And it is pretty interesting to compare here with this section of Scripture with something that was reiterated over and over again to the Israelites when they were coming out of the land of Egypt. My, uh, if my count is correct, in the books of Exodus through Deuteronomy, there are 15 occasions where the land of Canaan is described as a place flowing with what? Milk and honey, right? It's the land flowing with milk and honey. And you keep in mind that the people were not simply there to witness the milk and honey. They weren't simply just to observe it. But God's intention with the land of Canaan uh, and is part of the reason why God stopped providing them quail and manna was once they got to the land of Canaan, they had everything in the land to take care of themselves, including uh, the idea that the land was flowing with milk and honey, very resourceful. Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 20 talks about the Israelites, once they settled there, that they would eat of the land, including the, including the honey. And so God had made that commitment, that promise to the Israelites, if they're obedient to him, they would continue to enjoy that land flowing with milk and honey. But now Saul has made an oath that has essentially halted that benefit that God gave to them, right? Because here's honey laying right on the ground, nothing wrong with eating it, but Saul, because of a hasty decision, has now put the Israelites where, you know, they cannot eat they literally cannot eat of the honey that's on the ground. I think that's interesting to point out. It shows the, the recklessness of Saul's uh, quick decision. But we keep in mind that within all of this, Jonathan again has not heard what his father had said because he was obviously the one that instigated the, the, the conflict with the Philistines back in the beginning of chapter 14. He was away at the time. So Jonathan, of course, is in need of nourishment, right? So... Verse 27, uh, we, we give the indication Jonathan has not heard the oath. It says that he put forth the end of the rod that was in his hand. And, you know, you think about the case where Jonathan is in. You know, if you're really tired, um, and I know I'm not an older person, but I've, I've, I've taught a lot of older people, but, you know, when something falls in the floor, as an older person, sometimes it gets harder to bend over and pick that thing up, right? Uh, whatever you've dropped. Um, 
if you're really tired, right, it's hard to bend down and, and to pick something up generally. Uh, so you could almost imagine here Jonathan just taking the end of his rod rather than stooping down and, and picking it up with his hand to, to get the honey. Um, and it says that once he's eaten the honeycomb, right, the, the, the phrase put his hand to his mouth just means to, you know, take the honey and, and feed yourself, that his eyes were enlightened. I'll ask you this question, but have you ever seen, well, you think about, you think about what honey is, right? You know, honey is a lot of times used as a substitute for sugar. Um, you know, in the land of Palestine, they really didn't have a lot of sugar. At, at that time, a lot of sugar was actually grown in India. And so, again, the natural way that you would sweeten foods was often through honey. So a lot of people today still use honey as a substitute for sugar. Now I'll ask you this question. Have you ever seen somebody's eyes enlightened when they've eaten sugar? Yeah, when I was a kid, uh, my parents uh, forbid me from drinking something once it got certain to a certain point at night. What was that, Mom? Mountain Dew. Mountain Dew. I could not drink Mountain Dew. I don't know what the exact time frame was. I don't know how old I was. And I know Mountain Dew has caffeine in it, but Mountain Dew has a lot of sugar in it. And there's a reason why I did not eat, or I, I was not allowed to drink Mountain Dew after a certain time at night, because I would not go to sleep. My eyes were enlightened in that sense, right? I was fully awake. Uh, you think about younger kids, right? You think about when they eat sugar, they eat cake or something like that. They get really excited. They get wound up, um, right? So you think about that, your eyes are enlightened. Um, but what may have been going on here, if you think about Jonathan being very famished, uh, people that struggle with low blood sugar probably could relate to what Jonathan's experiencing here. The idea that if you have low blood sugar uh, and you, you probably wind up feeling a sensation that you begin to black out, right? Things start to become dark um, and you feel you're on the verge of, pain, uh, of passing out or fainting. And so, you know, in order to get your blood sugar back up, you've got to have something sweet. That's what Jonathan eats. Um, and some have suggested that it might have been that Jonathan suffered from hypoglycemia, which is, again, uh, deals with having a low blood sugar. But, again, that's just the idea of verse 27. Very famished. His blood sugar is very low. His eyes are enlightened in the, in the sense that he's not going to pass out now that he has fed himself. But here's the problem. People see what Jonathan has done. Verses, verse 28, Then answered one of the people and said, Thy father straightly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food this day. And the people were faint. Uh, and you think, about, you think about in this situation, Jonathan, you know, of all the people that sat there and just watched him eat that honey, he's going to tell on them, right? You, you think about Jonathan being as famished as he was, probably got a little annoyed with that. Um, but certainly he's going to be more annoyed with the oath that his father has made. So this, this individual, we're not told who he is, he steps up. Um, and, and you think about the, the courage that it takes here, right? Because this is not just a normal man that you're rebuking. This is the son of the king, who's the head of the army. And, you know, maybe you give credit to this man because... You know, it could have been very easy for him to turn his back and, and act like this doesn't happen. But, you know, again, maybe this is a man, of, a man of great principle because he's willing to do that. But, the important, but another important thing to point out, verse 28, is that very last phrase. Because the, um, it's not necessarily that the man says this, but it, it's recorded for us that the people were faint. So the idea was that morale was very low because people were hungry. Um, you know, it's not the idea that, you know, these are people just, you know, eating for the sake of eating. People, uh, the, the people in this situation, the, the soldiers needed, needed the nourishment. And it reinforces the idea that Saul's oath was a very bad decision because the people needed that nourishment in order to pursue after the Philistines. All right. So verse 29, Jonathan, Jonathan calls out his father. Then, then said Jonathan, my father hath troubled the land. See, I pray you how mine eyes have been enlightened because I tasted a little of this honey. How much more if happily the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies which they found for he had there not been 
Uh, for had there not been now a much greater slaughter among the Philistines. So Jonathan points out that it's really a bad, it was a bad decision to make. Sometimes you think in the, I think about another case in the Old Testament where uh, a group of indi individuals made a decision that, uh, made another dietary decision that you would not think worked out, but it did. Um, and you think about, and, and that example it comes from the book of Daniel, right? Because I don't know if I worded that quite where you could maybe know what I was looking for. Uh, you think about Daniel, Daniel chapter 1, right? Daniel and, and his friends, they're told that they were going to eat of the king's meat, which included unclean animals. And in that situation, Daniel really told the servant that had come from the king that they were only going to eat vegetables. They weren't going to eat of the king's meat. And then after eating that for a while, they were going to test the fitness of Daniel and his friends versus the other servants of Nebuchadnezzar. And it turns out that at the end of the process that, it, that the Bible records that Daniel and his friends were more fitter, uh, were, were better conditioned than, other, than, than some of Nebuchadnezzar's other men. And that was a situation where, you know, making what would, you would think to be an unwise dietary decision because you're not taking in protein. You wouldn't think it would work out, but it did. In this situation, Saul made a very unwise decision about his soldier's diet, and it doesn't work out for him. Jonathan points this out, that Saul has troubled the land. That word trouble was also used to describe what Achan had done in Joshua chapter 7, where Achan had stolen of the inhabitants of um, Jericho, I believe, and that as a result, the Israelites had lost the battle of Ai. So the problem was placed on Achan. Achan troubled Israel in Joshua 7. If you recall, 1 Kings chapter 18, same time this is used as well. But this time, King Ahab said that Elijah, and he asked Elijah, are you the one who's troubling Israel? Same exact idea that Jonathan's saying here. Right? We know Elijah wasn't really troubling Israel. Um, but the emphasis is that, that Saul's decision, it not only affected himself, but affected every single person that was in that army. And so Jonathan acknowledges by verse 30, the people needed food. How much more if happily the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies, which they found. And Jonathan's point is, if you had fed the army like they should have, if you had not put this restriction on here, you would have actually been successful in completely destroying the Philistines, which was what Saul's goal was. But he made a very bad decision. All that, think about all that food that was there that they couldn't eat. Some of it maybe went to, went to waste. Obviously, they're going to partake of it later on. Um, but it does real, bring up a very important point that sometimes the promises that we make, if we make them hastily and we don't think them through, sometimes we think that the promises that we make only affect us. Um, but in reality, sometimes our promises affect other people that are around us as well. You know, you think about, you know, you could probably think of a lot of different examples. I guess the first one that comes into my mind, you think about work, right? And, and maybe you work for a company and, you know, you're, you're debating about whether or not to take on an extra shift or an, or an extra level of work. And, you know, you think about it and, and, and you decide, I'm going to make that promise. I, I'm going to tell my employer... I'm willing to take on that extra shift or I'm willing to take on uh, a lot more work. And I'm, I'm going to guarantee that it'll get done. And, you know, maybe you make that oath and, and maybe you get that done, but you don't think about how that takes away from time at home or time away from your family or time away from church and, and the work of the church. And, you know, maybe you complete that task, maybe you don't. Um, and you might think that it only affected you in that situation, but in reality it affected everyone around you because you were so concerned about taking care of that oath, you didn't think about how it concerned the well-being of other people, right? And, and, and so, uh, again, we think about just that idea that sometimes when we make promises, we, we have to remember that they not only affect us, but they can affect the other people around us, as was the case with Saul. Uh, but verse 31 does note that they smote the Philistines that day from Michmash to Aijalon, uh, and the people were very faint. Um, and so it seems like, to a certain extent, they're successful, but that last phrase in verse 31, that the people 
now they are very faint, sets up the events of verses 32 through 35, which is the last section that we'll cover. And this is what we might call the sins of Saul, the sin of Saul's troops. So the people were very faint, verses 32 through 35. And the people flew upon the spoil and took sheep and oxen and calves and slew them on the ground. And the people did eat them with the blood. Then they told Saul, saying, Behold, the people sin against the Lord in that they eat with the blood. And he said, Ye have transgressed. Roll a great stone unto me this day. And Saul said, Disperse yourselves among the people and say unto them, Bring me hither every man his ox and every man his sheep. And slay them here, and eat, and sin not against the Lord in eating with the blood. And all the people brought every man his ox with him that night, and slew them there. And Saul brought it, built an altar unto the Lord, the same was the first altar that he built unto the Lord. So verse 32, the problem is, is that the people are so famished that they take the animals of the Philistines, and they not only kill them, they not only eat them, but they eat the blood with them. I don't know if you've ever watched videos of maybe at a zoo or uh, maybe at a place where they take care of animals uh, that, that are um, endangered. Um, but you think about animals like a lion or tigers or something like that, you, you generally don't get in the cage with them to feed them, right? Because, you know, they may eat you as well. Um, and, and I was watching a video the other day of these people they're just taking, you know, parts of an animal and throwing it over the side, and you would see the, the tigers and the lions sort of crowd around one another and, 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 and fight for that piece of, 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 the, of the animal. Uh, and you almost picture the same idea here, right? The people are sort of um, rushing to these animals. that They're, they're killing them, and, and, and we might think of this as, as like how animals can devour a carcass, how quickly they are, uh, how quickly they are attacking these animals. And so the problem is, is that, that, they, that they are eating them with the blood. So they're not draining the blood out of them. And according to Leviticus chapter 17, we don't have time to read it, but Leviticus 17 talks about the fact that the Israelites were commanded that they could not eat the blood of animals because life was in the blood. And this is where they have sinned. They are eating the animals, but they're eating the blood with them. And so they have broken the law of Moses. So verse 33, Saul hears about this, and he recognizes that the people have sinned. And he's going to try to amend the problem, which is also going to require putting to death some people, uh, possibly some people. And Saul, even though he's going to try to correct this problem, the problem itself started because of the oath that he made. So verse 33, the people have sinned against the Lord, you have transgressed, roll a great stone unto me this day. And what this rolling of a great stone means is just the idea of constructing an altar, right? That's what we see in verse 35, that Saul builds an altar. Keep in mind that part of what the altar did was that when you kill the animal, you put the animal on that rock and you could drain the blood out of it. You know, today if you go hunting, and generally, I know people that hunt deer, generally will hang the deer up to let the blood drain out of the, the carcass uh, sometimes before they go to uh, taking all the meat off the, the bones. Uh, and, and so that's, again, the idea. They're making these animal sacrifices, but they're actually going to drain the blood out of them. So verse 34, uh, they have to go and find uh, of the men, their, their ox, their sheep, the animals for sacrifice. And so verse 35, verse um, 35, Saul is going to sacrifice these animals to appease the wrath of God for the sins of the people. But the important point within all of this is that all of this can be pointed back to Saul's oath. Right? Because Saul made the oath. That's what really led the people, even though the people did eat the blood, and that, again, they were responsible for doing that. You go back and think, if Saul had not made that oath and let, allowed the people to eat before they marched on, this entire situation would not happen. And in the larger picture of 1 Samuel, this is another event that shows that Saul, at this point, is proving himself to be pretty ineffective as a leader of his people, which is, again, why back in chapter 13, Samuel told Saul that God was going to find a man after his own heart, because at this point, um, Saul is not. He is not the captain of his people, which is what God wanted him to be. 
With that being said, are there any comments that you'd like to add on to what we've talked about tonight? I sort of wonder, when the battle was going with Israel, you got all these people sort of on the sidelines to jump in and want to fight. Makes you wonder if the battle had been going the other way, if they would have been so eager, you know, to yeah. force it. And not just one, I don't know, but a lot of people jump on the bandwagon when they see the wagon headed their way, but they won't jump on the bandwagon and kill them. So. Right. Right, that's a really good point. Um, really good point. The point was made that a lot of, you know, back when the Israelites were fighting the Philistines back in verses 21 through 23, uh, again, how a lot of people jumped on the bandwagon uh, once they saw things were going well. Um, and that's, I think that's true with really just, you know, any, any part of life. People get involved with things once they see that they're succeeding, but a lot of times... Um, Sometimes there, 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 there is a time when you can take a, a wait-and-see approach, but there are other times when we need to be proactive because, um, again, nothing will ever get done unless we're proactive about the matter. Um, but that is a very good point to bring out. Some people waited, waited until things were going well to get on the bandwagon. Uh, well, that being said, we thank you for your time and your attention tonight. We'll pick up next week, 1 Samuel chapter 14, beginning in verse 36, and we'll really... Con- finish out the entire chapter next week. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention.